¿Dani apareció o no? No, pero no se está, me parece. Vamos, carajo. Sé que no se prende, me parece que si hablas ya están dando. ¿Ya están dando? Sí, sí, igual tendrías que pasarle el, el micrófono también a. A Dani, no está Vení, Dani, eh. No, no te preocupes, no te preocupes. Sí. Él tiene la guitarra. Yeah, don't worry about it. Don't worry, don't worry. The problem is we have to return this to Lorenzo. Lorenzo, no? Lorenzo me lo pidió ya. Te cuento que ya me la pidió. Sí. Me, la, me mandó un mensajito al Facebook. No, se escucha por esto, mira. Por esto. Sí, no hay manera de zafar. Sí, igual las frases cortas. Sí. Hace fr o pedí un micrófono más. ¿Quién es el...? Buenas tardes, yo soy, la, yo soy la líder de Argentina, Bea Strugo, y para mí es un gran placer y un gran honor presentarlo a un querido amigo y un querido artista, Vladimir Marchensky Arias. Eh, realmente eh, estoy muy segura que ustedes van a disfrutar de este momento. Muchas veces he hablado con él acerca de su posición con respecto a a la metodología de la enseñanza de la acuarela, acerca de su opinión sobre, que, sobre el arte, lo que es la transmisión de esta técnica tan importante. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, well, she is Bea Strugo, the country leader of Argentina, and she has the pleasure to present Vladimir Merchensky Arias, who is a great artist and he has a very special approach to the methodology of teaching watercolor in Argentina. That is something that uh, I was talking to him a lot of times. So uh, I think that this is something valuable that you will really enjoy. Vladimir Merchensky has studied with the most important artists of Argentina, for example, Gorbe Arena, Negro, tiene una formación muy importante, pero por sobre todas las cosas, porque no es, eh, es importante la formación, pero sobre todo es importante el alma, lo que uno transmite. Y además de ser un gran artista, es un gran investigador. No cesa de investigar sobre su propia obra y además sobre el método de enseñanza 
en su propia escuela. Vladimir has studied with the greatest uh, masters and um, he is a person who is in a continuum searching for how to improve uh, their methodology of teaching, how to improve the way you teach watercolor to his students. Bueno, es un gusto. Los dejo con Vladimir. Well, with a great pleasure, we leave you with Vladimir. Thank you. Thank you very much to everybody. Well, I have to confess something. Uh, of course, English is not my mother tongue, not my first language, so I'm a little scared about my English. I apologize, I ask you to be patient with that. And uh, for example, I don't know how to say if it's good evening or good afternoon at this time. That's a, a little sample. <laughs> but anyway, first of all, I have to thank, of course, to thank you very much to Bea and to Anna for this space. I really appreciate to can share with you my investigation, but it's not only the, the opportunity to expose. I don't want only to expose something. For me, it's very important to share because I want the feedback from you, you know? I'm, I'm getting involved in something that I think it's a great issue, a great problem we are, we have to uh, think about. It's how we teach watercolor, how we work with uh, thinking about a teacher training program, not just how each master explains his own receipt. I think it's much better if we think about how we prepare new teachers. So, if we want teachers to be, to have confidence about how to work, we have to work together in all this community to develop didactic material. That's why this talk is about grammar, what I call it. Uh, I realized there are two different kinds of ways we can uh, teach in a, in a workshop. You know, you can, as a student, and the master says, okay, I will tell you how to paint like me. This is one way. So this, this teacher, this master explains his own recipe. This is one way. The other way, is to get the basic language behind this recipe, okay? It's a totally different way of teaching and to thinking about this material I will teach about. So, for me, it's very important to talk about those three people, Pablo Picasso, Jason Nimmer, and Suzuki. Well, I don't know how to explain who is Pablo Picasso, of course. We, knows, we know he was wondering about what is this of drawing, losing control? What is to paint, feeling the way children do? Children does. This is one of the topics we are talking about when we think on freshness in watercolor. Losing control is one of the topics. The other guy, Jason Nimmer, he has not invented acro yoga as a discipline, but he is uh, an acrobatic guy, and on not, not, not too much ago, 12, 20 years ago, he started preparing teachers for the acro yoga discipline. So he had to prepare a teacher training program. And he started traveling around the world, giving those classes, teaching, and uh, explaining to other teachers how to do this activity. 
And the third guy is Suzuki. It's a very famous method he has invented with one special thing, you know. He realized that children can learn the first, the, the mother tongue, the first language, without effort, without any effort. So he said, okay, what's going on here? If we are learning something so difficult as Germany language or Japan language or Spanish language, without any difficult, what is going on there? Why they, they get this information so quickly? And he started a very interesting method, that is the Suzuki method, for learning, for teaching violin. It was so great, this method, that other musicians started applying to different instruments. So there are music schools using this method in the early years. But it's not only for childhood, it's useful for anybody, the Suzuki method. So, I really appreciate when we get something like this clock from Zlubik. Mo most of us, we, we know this kind of material. This is the kind of material I am trying to develop in my school in Buenos Aires. And of course, I am not the only one. This, what I want to present, it's not a closed material at all. It's just something I am trying to share with you because I want this feedback to continue developing that. This is very important to talk about. This is not a closed material. This is just a point of view. So, you know what is a wiki space? Wiki is a place where all, where everybody collaborate. That's the most important thing we can share, we can have in this, in this spaces, as Fabriano in Aquarello is. Those special places where we share our knowledge and we take from others uh, the, beauty of, the, the beauty of their own methods. But it's very important to say we are not trying to get a uniform way of painting at all. We are not trying to do that. We don't want a unique recipe. That's not useful at all. We have to keep styles. All the community of watercolorists, we need this variety. So, what we need is to get a method to teach, not a method, a unique method to, to paint. Okay? That's very important to say. So, there are a lot of different things we can think about when we are talking about develop a teacher training program. But the first thing, and I think the most important, is the environment. How we prepare our teachers and how we start developing watercolor schools around the world. And how those schools work together. That's the most important thing. We have the opportunity right now because we are sharing a time together. We are sharing a lot of different points of view. So, those last two dots, students' exercises and teachers' guides, are not the same thing. Are not the same thing. When we talk about working together to develop didactic, didactic material, we, are, we have to make a difference between those. So, okay, that's too much for now, but let's talk quickly about this. We have two different brains. 
The limbic brain, we have three, but it's not important the first. Uh, neocortex, homo sapiens brain. Now, here we have some difference between those, but we have to work with both, not only to think about interpret, but to play too. What is a playful uh, environment, a playful atmosphere where we can work, when we can, we can learn, when we can teach? That's the most important thing. How I get this? When I have a teacher who has the right tool, so he feels confidence to do his work. That's our responsibility here as a community to develop this kind of material. So I started thinking about what is a water color graphene? What is a water color graphene? That is the opposite of the receipt. Instead of teaching receipts, we have to think about the tool behind. The tool behind is a minimum, an individual cell, an individual unit. I can't divide this unit because it's a basic thing on the watercolor language. So, I don't want to get you boring about a lot of different cells. I will just, ex just explain some of them as an example. Because it's not the matter how we define them, the problem is how we share this together to say, okay, we are all in the same train trying to get the same point, the same destiny. Of course, it's really hard to be all um, agree in, a, in an agreement about everything in this material, in this didactic material. I don't think it's, a, 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 it's an easy work, but I think it's very interesting to try. So, for example, we have transparency. We know transparency is something we define on the palette. And we can see better the transparency on a gradient. When we paint over a black gradient, we can uh, understand the transparency of each work or uh, it's, it doesn't matter the trademark. But the most important thing is, for example, this matrix. I have this side that explains the transparency and this side that explains what happened with the paper. What water on the paper, water on the palette, water on the paper. Only that, a visual tool. So I have sharpened edge or hard edge, diffuse edge. This is, the, we can, can call this a lot of ways, but for example, we say background or aureole. And the last one, gradient, fading line, okay? Well, but if we try to work with three waters, the paper water, the brush water, and the palette water, then we have more problems to explain about in the same material work. For example, the white line explains how is the brush, how is the, the water on the brush. We, we did divide the scene in four. The first, the second, the third, and the fourth. This explains the dry paper. This explains not the dry, not the wet, both. We have dry paper on the side and, and wet paper on the other. This explains the wet paper and this explains the damp or most paper. I don't want to take more attention about this because I know we can't fall asleep with that. It's not important. 
The important thing is, okay, what we can do with this, with this unit, with this individual cell? Okay, for example, I can explain how to get unity when I work with a layer over another. I have six tools to work with if I want to add a new layer and avoid getting contrast. I have diffuse brush strokes, gradient or faded lines, transparent shapes, intense line, partial brush strokes or frotties, and burst brush strokes with a spray or with a splatter, you know. Why I work with lines if I am working with an intense brush, with an intense mix? Because if I work with surfaces, it doesn't get unity, it gets contrast. That is a simple example about how to explain the tools the student has to mix a, a new layer with the background. So, those are quick examples. Uh, an abstract example with diffuse or hard edge base. Back, backgrounds, line of pencil, gradient, transparent, color, frottis. Well, this is another example. Here we have, I don't know, a simple landscape. I add the diffuse, add the transparent surface, add the frottis, the partial stroke, strong line, hard strong line, gradient, and here I make the contrast because it's not a line, it's a surface. But if I don't want that, I can break that, I, I can burst the edges with a spray or with a splatter. So, any kind of examples, okay? They work that way. But we are talking about a basic thing. I will pass some other examples. Diffuse, diffuse in the front, throw this, and this is a new landscape with other imaginary. Diffuse background, new layers. Here, I, I, will, I know I will need contrast, but I keep a lot of whites. Frotties. What's going on with all those examples? There is one tool that is stronger than the rest. That is the gradient, but it's not a simple line. The gradient can't be combined with the others. For example, I had some frotties. Of course, I feel this as a, as a diffuse edge. But this all is one cell, very expressive. This is the, the gradient, the faded line. Why it's so beautiful and it's so useful, this, this basic cell? Because if I have a landscape and can work the way that I separate and I keep the, the, the white on my subject. I keep the light on the center because I am fading out the shadows with the gradient. So, this is a very interesting sample. Here I have the figure and the gradient helps me to understand the figure and keep the light inside my subject. That's why it's so useful. Of course, of course watercolorists use a lot this tool. This tool is used a lot. But we have two different kinds of shadows here. I have this kind of shadow to describe the volume, and I have another kind of shadow that I steal from this bus relief. What is this shadow? The cell I use is the same one. 
is the gradient, is the faded line. But which is the, which is the difference between those? The synthetic valorism just describes the order. It doesn't describe the volume. It's not as the academic valorism. So, this is a paint from Sul Solar. It's a very important painter, uh, not living, friend of Borges, I don't know if somebody knows about him, but I love this writer and I love this painter. Sul Solar. Negro. McIntyre. Hokusai. George O'Keefe. Well, why it's so important to describe this other method? Because we keep the light on our subject. It's not the only thing we can do with this shape. We can say what is in front and what is behind. Okay? We are not describing only shapes because I'm describing backgrounds too. And I'm saying what is in front and what is behind. That's why it's so useful. And if I have this kind of squash, I, I, I don't know how to say that. ¿Cómo era la palabra, Daniel? Mancha. Splash. Splash. I have this kind of splash. I can work with the gradient to describe something inside the splash. After that, I can work with the color. Or I can describe something else, I don't know. It's very useful. For example, if I describe shapes with this tool, it's not important if I get burst after. The, the reliability, the legibility of the, the shapes, it's wonderful. So, here is a very nice example. I don't know if you, if you, I don't know how to put it bigger, larger. Um, anyway. So, I have those tools, like Impressionist Coma. There was half a century using the same resource to describe something. Why happened that? Because suddenly we understand this is an, an important grapheme in our visual speech. Besides, the faded line has another thing inside. We can't work to get ornaments with it. For example, this. Just going inside the light. So I can work this kind of compositions. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Lines, only lines, faded lines, okay? Well, and I can work with ornaments on diffuse edges inside the tool. I'm combining them, not only the burst edge. Why is it so important that? Because I suddenly I start understanding what I'm reserving. I am keeping the white, but it's not the hard edge white. It's the diffuse edge white. So, a very simple landscape using this gradient and a different kind of landscape using the same gradient. One, if an out, it's an outlined gradient, and the other is a surface gradient that describes volume. So I can do that with the, with the second one. I can describe volumes. If I have any kind of very playful thing, I, I will start making reliability and legibility and objects with this tool, with this tool, both of them. So, many watercolorists work that way. They paint with color and if they need some contrast, they will add this. 
over the, la the, the, the layer. With different tools, we, we saw them. The dark line, the photos, but that's another example. I can work the other way. It's only to work with the shadows first, so I avoid to, to hurt the color, and after that, I add the color. That's a very interesting way I can teach how to work with shadows, because I keep out the color. Besides, if I use the shadows that way, the palettes get unity. So it's very important to teach this other way to the students. So, that's a, a simple material I give in the school. I'm not sure if the best at all, but it explains how to work with color, with the surface, without hurting the other surface that is behind. The important thing, change room way, master of masters. We know we don't have to work with a lot of layers. We know that. So, how we work? Larger surfaces, lighter surfaces. And while I am reducing the shapes, I am getting stronger. Stronger, reducing the shapes. Stronger, reducing the shapes. That's the way we work. So, if I want to talk about this with a student, that doesn't want to know about pers uh, perspective, it is okay if I work the same way in an or ornament. For example, this. Large surfaces, darker and smaller. Large and diluted surfaces, darker and smaller. With a subject, lighter, darker and smaller. With any kind of strokes inside, the gradient, color, a very randomness, texture, surfaces, ornaments. With a collage, burst, gradient, color and ornaments with another stain. Gradient, color and ornaments. Another one, gradient, color and ornaments. So, for example, I have this. I need to be careful about light. I shut down the rest. After that, I work with gradient, color, and the rest of the tools, protis. Huge surfaces, transparent an ornament, another one. So I get legibility, okay? Why is so important that? Sorry, I have a lot of those. This is another subject. I am learning how to describe lights and shadows first, before the color, and I am learning how to get unity with the colors because the, the browns and the dark is working behind the color. Another thing it's very important to talk about is atmospheric perspective. Darker when I get closer to the, to the, to the viewer. Okay? Darker. So, I have another landscape. I practice that. After that, I can practice with mountains. Or with trees, smaller and bigger, larger. But there is something I have to talk about. This is always on sharp edges, on hard edges. What happens if I put water? Because those trees are hard edge. What happened with this? Soft, diffuse edges. I start with diffuse edges, diffuse edges, and suddenly I put this tree with hard edges. 
but I have to burst it with a splatter or with a spray to get unity. Diffuse edges behind, sharpen edges, stronger, 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 darker. Another problem, what happened with duplicated edges? I have something, three boxes, and start painting, surface uh, beside another surface, and suddenly it started to duplicate the outline. What's going on with that? I have to develop strategy to talk about with the, with the student. So I think this is the example to avoid, and this is the strategy to avoid the thing, the subject. Another thing, how to get freshness. So I get a portrait, and I start working with that. The same tools. The same tools, but a different, different strategy. So it's most important, it's more important to think about the unit, the, the, the individual cells, to explain the rest be, uh, after. Okay? Freshness and unity. The student tried to avoid this kind of things. This kind of edges, when it contaminates it, when it goes one water on the other. What's going on with that? Or, for example, this kind of differences, splatter. What, what's going on with all those effects? What is this? Is it just an effect or is it a grapheme, a basic grapheme? Well, it depends on the author, of the painter. Some painters use this in a basic place, and some others think it is just an effect. So we have a lot of different effects with salt, I don't know, a lot of different materials. I really don't know the name of those in English, so I will just show you. I have some material here. It's a lot of material with different chemistry things. But it's not so important, this. What I'm trying to talk about is, the designers had two very important theoretic guys. One of them was Rudolf Arnheim. Arnheim write, wrote a book called Perception in Visual Space. Donis Dondis made another, wrote another book called Syntaxis, Visual Syntaxis. They are trying, they were trying to study the structure of the visual language. I am trying to do the same with watercolor. It's not an easy work. I can't do this alone at all. And I think it's very important we can do this, that together. Because if we have this material, we can think about exercises for our students. Because the student material is not the same than the material I need to work when I prepare a teacher, a watercolor teacher. So, we have a lot of people working on books, on watercolor books, and very good watercolor books, manuals, explaining how to paint, a lot of different subjects. I know there is a lot of material there. We have to agree about, or discuss, or debate about how we name each of those units, but I'm sure that we can do that, because we share this space. And I'm sure that if we give people the ability, the skill, to teach another people, another person, how to paint, we are making a better world. We are getting, when we plant the seed of art, we are making a beautiful heart, 
a beautiful society and a beautiful world. Thank you very much. Maybe they have questions. Oh, yes, of course. Maybe any of you has a question to ask to Vladimir? I do have a question. Uh, can, can you come here so everybody can, can know what we are asking? At what point of your teaching, after all these examples, because you're teaching about edges, about diffused edges, and coming stronger to the, to the mm, foreground. At what point of your teaching you will use the knowledge of light in atmospheric perspective? Because you never mentioned atmospheric perspective, which... Oh, sorry. Because they have to know what uh, you are asking, yeah. otherwise they, they can... Yeah, follow. thank you, Anna. Uh, yeah, because all of these examples that you did, in my mind, was light, light light, atmospheric perspective. So where at your point, at what point of your teaching you will mention that? About light, if it's so important. Yeah. Yes, well, uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, I think the most important subject is we have to distinguish the basic cells. After that, it's something we have to discuss, the timing of each cell. If we are talking, those were just examples. Maybe, yes, I'm wondering a lot about lighting, but it would be great if we have examples about color or about something else. I don't care right now what, which is the right time to talk with the student about light or about color or about drawing or about structure or about composition. I care, I, I'm wondering about how we work together and how we make a wiki space for this material. So we can listen together and we can talk together about this in the same level because I'm not sure if I have a, the right answer for this question, but I'm sure that you have one answer for this question, because you made a question, because you are wondering about this. You make this question to me, because you are saying, okay, I don't, I'm not sure if I like this point of view. I think it's better to take more, more attention about this question, this, the thing that is light, or this other thing that is shape or drawing. Uh, it's not a work that one mind can't solve at all. It's something we have to do together. So there is not an answer for that. It's very important to make answers, to, sorry, to make questions like this one to start the debate. It's not a, we have this debate all the time. I'm sure we are talking about this all the time in a, any place. But I think we have to work together to start answering those kind of questions in this space, in, in right these places. That's why I present the subject. Thanks, thanks for your question. For example, I have a little feeling, and that's just a feeling. I will, exam I will talk with numbers, but it's just a feeling. If I take 2,000 pieces of art in different museums of the world, for each 2,000 contemporary art pieces, I have I don't know, 200 pieces of 
visual art. For each 200, I have 50. A uh, lot of most of those are oils and acrylic. 50 watercolors. For it, those 50 watercolors, I have one abstract, and the rest are naturalism. I don't know. I feel that there is watercolor is not a popular discipline, but we are failing about how to teach this discipline because we can make this a popular thing. We can make watercolor to get the schools on the, on the traditional education. Some countries work with watercolor on the schools. That's why I'm wondering about to, not to discuss only the grammar. Instead of that, we have to talk about preparing. I, the dream I have is to develop a teacher training program, a teacher training program for watercolor. Because if we do that, we will see the activity to grow. It will increase. That's, that's all. Thank you very much. Do you remember that last year we gave this man, this artist, this man? It's more important to be the man than the artist. We gave him the, the prize uh, for uh, the recognition of the Fabriano 2018. We were right. <laughs> you did great. Thank you very much. You are amazing. Uh, and you are young and you are the future. Uh, you represent yourself, the future, and you have the school that you are going up, up very greatly. Thank you for your space. Thank you. Thank you very much. And guys, everything he has said is in uh, YouTube, in, um, in Arte Fabriano, and you can find it and listen again and again. Spread the name of this person as, as much as you can. Please do. Thank you, Vlad. Thank you. Now, <laughs> Sagarete.